Hi, I'm Adam. I'm a Manitoba PA working in general surgery at the Health Sciences Centre in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Manitoban all my life. I grew up rurally in a uh, small town, St. Francis Xavier, uh, St. Francois Xavier, if you will, uh, west of Winnipeg, kind of towards Portage. Family not really involved in healthcare whatsoever, uh, but at an early age I just was really interested in health sciences and you know one day it's like a lot of people who ended up in the PA profession long before there was a PA profession here they wanted to be a doctor subsequently moved to the city in my university years uh, went to University of Manitoba had a pretty rough first year uh, of university it was a real uh, reality check subsequently took a year off of university went into a practical nursing program where I subsequently went and got my certificate in nursing I was a it's called a licensed practical nurse and it was great it was great exposure to the healthcare system and it, it really reaffirmed like why I was pursuing a career in, in, in the health sciences uh, went on completed my nursing uh, degree at that point and just really had a hunger for working in the system um, after a long career as a nurse I, I just wanted to do something different I'd worked within the nursing model for quite some time had a great uh, tour if you will of the profession where I did training in, uh, in dialysis nursing, hemodialysis and nephrology nursing, uh, critical care nursing, and I felt that I had achieved a lot of the things that I, that I wanted to achieve, and being somebody who just, I'm addicted to going to school, and you know, I was like, what, what's next? And I want to explore a different model, which is what led me towards the uh, physician assistant uh, curriculum. Uh, the big draw was the, the medical model versus the nursing caring model. Uh, just kind of keep things fresh and get a different perspective of the system. What, what yeah. did you apply? My first job as a, as a nurse, as a licensed practical nurse, was at the Health Sciences Center in, in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Anyone in the PA professionals, Manitoba, at least we like to think that we're the be and end all of, 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 of physician, everything physician assistant. But uh, I was introduced very early on to a neurosurgery PA who is the, the program director of our school. Ian Jones was one of the first PAs I actually uh, met and, you know, started getting interested in what his role was uh, in the neurosurgery population. Became very interested in that and thought, wow, this is a great, um, this is a great model that kind of bridges uh, medicine and nursing. And I was, I, I want to retain my bedside uh, skill set and you know, have a little bit more of a variety and also mobility. So I really started eyeballing the PAs and uh, we also had clinical assistants, uh, very similar to PAs. It was, a, it was a great, like the Health Science Center was a great uh, starting point to really just witness PAs firsthand and how, what their roles are. Most of the PAs at the Health Sciences Center that I've interacted with are in surgical subspecialties and you know fortunately that was my, uh, that was my background as a nurse um, so I got to kind of figure out what, what, uh, what aspects I could kind of pull towards a career um, where I to pursue that uh, versus going into higher education from a nursing model which would have been the, the NP stream for example. But yeah, my first exposure was, was to Ian Jones who's a pioneer uh, uh, of the program. How was your experience in first year PA school? <laughs> I, I was first off thrilled to, to have that opportunity. Um, I came in with a little bit of an attitude that you know like I had almost 10 years of nursing experience that you know, I, what I wanted to do was was kind of refine my skill set in my mind. I'm like, you know what, like I've done two nursing programs and what I'm going to take from, from the PA is I'm going to try to consolidate and really specialize. It, not to sound cliche, but you know, the drinking from a fire hose thing uh, was very evident very early on. It's, it's, it's a very fast paced curriculum and uh, surprisingly I, I learned so much more than I even expected. Um, it was challenging from the from the perspective of trying to work as well. I, I was somebody who was under the uh, illusion that I was going to be able to work part-time and kind of you know fund some of my education and that went away really quickly and it was easy. Uh, it was easy to kind of relinquish work and, and, and just fully focus on the program because I had a great time um, on a personal level. I had, I had a great batch of students that I worked with that I, that I learned with and we all really complemented each other very well. It was a great experience um, just being in that group, but wow, was it stressful? Um, the, the the content is so fast-paced. It's condensed medicine in in one year of didactic experience, and then on to uh, the clinical aspect. Drinking from a fire hose is a good analogy. So, mm -hmm. what's involved exactly in second year PA school? Yeah, so second year we're we're turned loose on the world, so to speak, and you know you get this condensed. Uh, 
didactic medical uh, curriculum slammed at you for one year. You're also trying to figure out what you're going to do for your capstone project as well. You're preparing for exams after the first year and you're in, in clinical rotations at that point in year two. It's a lot of juggling. Now you're, now you're essentially working a job while you're still in school. There's also obligations that you have while working on different uh, subspecialties during your clinical year, during your rotations. You're expected to present and lecture to uh, other medical learners, whether it's med students, other PA students, nursing students. And that's all part of kind of bringing together the, uh, the classroom aspect while at the same time learning how to function and develop your hands-on, your uh, CAN-MEDS competencies, becoming a communicator, developing interpersonal uh, relationships and just learning how to function in, in, in the real medical world. It's, it's, it's really challenging but it is a lot of fun. It's, it, sitting in a classroom for that long it's nice to actually get out there and say okay let's, let's see what I've learned, let's see what I can do. Where, were you, where did you do your core rotations? What specialties? The PA program in Manitoba, uh, you know, there, there's a big push towards getting uh, physician assistants involved in primary care which is you know a, a huge need. So we did a lot of rotations, uh, our, our main rotations were in family medicine, uh, internal medicine, obstetrics, gynecology, uh, and as far as rotations for electives, I, you know, I'm, I'm biased towards surgery, it's what I, what I, what I grew up doing as a nurse, so I, I chose a lot of surgical, surgical subspecialties as, as my uh, core electives. Um, I had opportunity to do uh, rotations in cardiac sciences. Uh, general surgery, which is where I currently work right now, and then also I, I, I did a rotation in uh, infectious diseases, um, which was a, a huge utility. Uh, when you're choosing your electives, I would recommend to anyone, don't necessarily just focus on what you want to do, but what is going to complement what you want to do, because uh, in clinical years, that is your, that's your chance to fail. Um, and by fail, I mean that's when you're, you're trying out things, when you're trying to consolidate your knowledge and uh, see what works, see what doesn't. It's a, it's a, safe, it's a safe environment to, to fail and try out new things and, and try to become the clinician you want to be. Where did you, uh, what were the geographic locations? Were you concentrated in Winnipeg or were there opportunities for rural? I can't speak for the uh, program currently, um, but there were rural, um, rural placements available. For myself, I stayed um, I stayed mainly in Winnipeg as well. I did some some time in uh, Porge la Prairie, which is just I mean it's not I, I wouldn't go as far as say it's rural. It's fairly fairly large enough town, but uh, I mean it is considered rural. And I I went out there because I had a family doc friend, and I would go out there and like almost extracurricular, almost activity. Uh, I'll drive out um, usually on Fridays after my clinical rotations. Uh, during the second year of the PA program, he'd show up there and he'd be running the, uh, he'd be the only doc in the ER. So he was thrilled to have me there, and I'll kind of tag along and kind of get a, a taste of rural medicine. And you know, it's it's it, there's a stark difference between practicing rurally in an, an emergency room versus a tertiary care facility like in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Other students elected to go, I believe, as far as Churchill. As far as placements in the U.S., I, I haven't seen anything like that. Even as an elective student, I mean, our our, our the way PAs are 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 structured and legislation around it. We don't have that portability to the U.S. at this time, but I believe some students did pursue uh, some clinical encounters in the U.S. Uh, myself, I stuck close to home, uh, and uh, slowly, uh, short, uh, uh, not too far away on the fringes in Porters the Prairie. But uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of opportunity. Um, at least early on in the program, you may have to kind of make those opportunities for yourself and be very proactive, and which is what you should. There's a great opportunity in our in our new profession right now to kind of push that and try to try to get exposure and also let other people uh, throughout the province or throughout Canada or wherever you're going see what PAs can do. It's, it's, it's a great advocacy point actually even though it may not seem as one. You graduated a few years ago so mm -hmm. at the time how did your class find jobs? Yeah, great question. Um, so I believe at the time um, Ian Jones may disagree with me but I, I, I recall that at the time it was the last year I believe that we were kind of loosely guaranteed jobs um, upon graduation. We did have a list of jobs that were protected for newer, gra for, uh, newer graduates uh, once we were completed the program. And it wasn't limited to that. I mean, a lot of uh, students went and pursued, um, 
pursued jobs and actually you know developing their own positions, which is which is absolutely amazing. I see a lot of PAs doing that now. Um, advocated for it, you know, there's a, you know, I want to work in pediatric neurology, but there's no pediatric neurology position. Well, how do I get there? Well, you, you track down the physician, you create awareness of what PAs are, you do clinical rotations, you volunteer, you demonstrate your abilities, and it's amazing. I, I've never seen it in any other profession, but the jobs will will materialize with enough push. Um, for myself, I was fortunate. Uh, I, I, I had a lot of surgery positions, which is where the the big need is right now, I mean, the models seem to be uh, more robust and better demonstrated in, in surgical subspecialties where PAs can pinch in when the surgeons are in the OR and there are a lot of job opportunities at the Health Sciences Center, which is, it's, it's like home to me. Um, there are a lot of job opportunities in surgery there, which is what I was geared towards and um, had a pretty good, pretty good list of uh, locations to interview for and, and pick. And, so I, as far as the job scene goes right now, it's, it's, it's a little bit different right now and you know, without getting into the specifics, I mean we all know there's funding model issues, um, uh, regulation of other provinces, so it's, it's not as easy it seems, but I think the take home message is if, if you have an interest in a certain area and that's what you want to do, um, go for it, push forward, advocate for yourself, advocate for the profession and uh, try to carve out a little niche for yourself and for the profession in the future. Well, that's exactly what we tell students in Ontario. So glad yeah. that's a, a mindset world uh, Canada wide. Absolutely. Um, where do you work now as a PA? So uh, currently as a PA, I work at the Health Sciences Center, like, and that's, that's home for me. Uh, it's a tertiary care facility in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, the facility uh, services uh, most of Canada, the north as well. Um, we provide specialty services in, in multiple fields from uh, neurological surgery to surgical subspecialties to uh, specialized medicine as well. Um, I got my position in the uh, Department of Surgery, General Surgery, and I split my time between two subspecialties, uh, one being uh, surgical oncology, which uh, focuses on predominantly GI malignancy, so we see a lot of gastric cancer, a lot of colon cancer. Um, we also run clinics uh, uh, for breast health, uh, focusing on uh, breast cancers as well, um, as well as melanoma clinics where we, we have, a, have a little section of, of dermatology that we focus on, mainly melanoma, um, and we follow patients there. My other appointment, I usually, I, myself and another PA work on, this, on, on the two services, and just as in an effort to allow us to keep our skill sets up in both, we usually switch every three months to, to these opposite services. We're all stationed on the same wards, but uh, you know, we just switch for a little bit of, uh, keeps things fresh. And that other specialty is uh, HPB, or uh, hepatical pancreatic biliary surgery, so liver pancreas and bile duct surgery. And again, it is also a, a surgical subspecialty um, uh, based in surgical oncology, so a lot of pancreas cancers. Um, we also do a lot of the same overlap stuff uh, the green surgery will do, um, including gastric cancers, um, but predominantly focused on, on the HPB aspect. Mm -hmm. And um, when you were first hired as a fresh new grad, yeah. how did they orient you to the service once you were hired? <laughs> yeah, um, before, my, before, before my arrival uh, in the general surgery program, there was no experience with PAs. They had a clinical assistant uh, who had been working there for some time, but the role wasn't as broad and it was, uh, it was quite different than what, um, what the attendings envisioned for a PA coming on. So it was, it was we were breaking kind of new ground uh, and it was a lot of learning back and forth. So how I got oriented uh, was, was me showing up uh, my first day at seven in the morning uh, to the ward. Uh, my attending was there and you know, we had our introductions again. We had last seen each other at the interview process. And I remember this uncomfortable silence and I, I looked at him like, so what do you envision my role being here? And it was kind of a laugh and, and the attending was like, well, what do you envision your role being here? So it was, um, it was fun at that moment I realized that, wow, this is, this is a job that can kind of carve out my own niche as well and, and, and try to offer, offer services which are gonna Im, Im, improve efficiencies and patient care. Um, so it was, it, it was, 
it, it's, it's an odd way to start a new job, but you know, in retrospect, it's like, yeah, this is a new profession. They didn't have experience with this. And like I said, it's a great opportunity to kind of like build that job around kind of what I wanted to do. And then it's just evolved over time, you know, demonstrating competencies, building up your own skill set. And then it's, it's amazing, you're, you know, if it was, if there was a schematic, it'd be like arrows coming out about how you branch out and the diversity of your job and the different skills you end up uh, picking up and procedures you do. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting that my, my first day especially, I was kind of scratching my head, I'm like, wow, like, this is new ground. Was there any shadowing that was involved or did you hit the ground running seeing patients right away? Hit the ground running. Um, Shortly after uh, meeting with uh, my attending on my first day, it was, you know, okay, we went over kind of things. I was very familiar with the clinical systems, having worked at the health sciences for quite some time over many years. Um, but I remember my attending was like, okay, well, uh, I'm going to let you read up on the patients. Um, I'm going to go to the operating room. <laughs> and, you know, I, I really relied on, um, on other team members from the multidisciplinary team to kind of, you know, piece together and, and, and learn from them where other aspects aside from you know the surgery part and the medical side where else I can pinch in and, and hopefully create better system efficiencies so you know I, I had an easy in with the nursing crew because you know I, I had that I was able to relate in that way um, having been a nurse um, it was touching base with social workers physiotherapists and kind of advocating for myself from a selfish perspective uh, with the secondary you know the intention being like you know to like create awareness about PAs and kind of see you know what can I do to complement their their work um, or the care that they're delivering and you know like how do we make things better so the, the, the biggest assistance came from as far as ward management and the, the little details the scut work of the job uh, came from collaborating with other people who are, who are doing what I'm doing um, or who are doing a lot of the traditional roles uh, that, that they've done for a long time and trying to pinch, pinch in there and find out what I can do. And would you say that initially when you were starting, was your role very similar to that of a resident or, um, or a fellow? Yeah. Um, when I started off, I was, I was you know, the, the goal was to get uh, get the physician assistants helping in in a few main areas and that was number one the biggest need was was uh, on the ward because you know as a tertiary care hospital with with medical residents as for surgical residents um, you're trying to also facilitate their learning too and allowing them to have a better experience in the operating room where they're learning to be surgeons so the big part the initial phase was to kind of cover that ward aspect and you know there's concerns about patient care suffering when, when teams are caught in the OR and you know discharges get delayed so I started off kind of mainly focused on uh, on ward based work uh, management of patients in the perioperative uh, kind of period you know before surgery after surgery um, dealing with uh, basic assessments lab interpretation uh, and then once kind of my core was was my, my, my core skill set from you know the medical aspect aspect uh, of the management of surgical patients was kind of solidified and my attendings were happy then I started branching into uh, other roles and that's where I started to feel more like a resident um, uh, former director Russ Ives said you know he had a good description we always struggle how to describe you know, ourselves as, 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 as physician assistants and he had a quick one and it was you know I'm a resident who never leaves and I, I, I feel that way myself now um, as my team's confidence in, in my skills uh, you know evolved I start to branch into into different things you know seeing consults doing procedures unsupervised um, working in clinics, going to the operating room, and just gaining more more autonomy uh, and less direct supervision at all times. Um, so initially, I felt more like a like a like a medical student, and then you know pretty pretty quickly, I, I became you know a, a junior resident, and now I feel like I'm you know at, at a at a more senior resident kind of level with you know the tasks I do. It's it's we're all running around the hospital, all pinching in, and all trying to help out and get it done. Can you describe a typical day in the life or week in the life of your work? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. I always tell people it's, 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 it's heterogeneous and never, you know, when, when I talk to students, I say, I'll tell you what my week's like, but don't, uh, don't think that that's the same right across the board. If you don't like what I do, well, you know, don't think that's just the profession. But um, a week in my life, day in my life, 
uh, depending what service I'm on, uh, usually come in, we round as a team on the patients and we have anywhere between uh, three patients uh, on the ward because it's a surgical subspecialty to as much as 20 patients, the average being probably, probably close to about 12 or so. So round on the patients. As a team, we, we, we sit down after rounds are done. We come up with a plan where to allocate our human resources, whether it be PA students, med students, residents. Uh, we make a decision about who's going to the operating room based on uh, experience, uh, the cases that are going on. Um, some people will go to the ward. A lot of the times, uh, if we have a big resident team, they'll take priority, they'll go to the operating room and get in their, their index cases, the big ones that they have to know before they graduate. Um, a lot of my day, if I'm, if I'm on the ward that day, I will be doing my own second set of rounds, usually in the afternoon. I arrange diagnostics, uh, small procedures on the ward, opening wounds, assessing patients. Uh, hopefully uh, not having to run codes, but kind of dealing with uh, the daily unpredictable things. Um, consults are another part of, uh, part of the job. Uh, I usually have most pages coming to myself. I'm territorial, uh, so when I'm on the ward I like to kind of know what's going on along, around the facility if we have any bounce back. So a lot of time we'll get calls in the emergency room, see a patient that unfortunately may have come back with a wound infection, assess them. If it's something I feel confident in, uh, it'll be a quick call, a call to, the, uh, to my attending, kind of review them, send them on, bring them in. Um, another aspect would be clinic days as well too, depending again on our human resources that day. Uh, you know, it can get pretty busy, you know, you're juggling ward stuff and also running uh, to a clinic and seeing, uh, seeing patients in a, in a, in a, in a 40, 40 patient clinic uh, in, in, in melanoma or breast health, which is really involved. I mean, like I said, we're a surgical subspecialty team, so it's, it's, it's really detailed assessments and then you know, collaborating with the team, coming up with a plan, and then running off to the uh, to the to the operating room if need be. You know, sometimes the attendings get called in for their expertise in another room, and then you know my pager goes off as, "Hey, can you come to the operating room and help out here?" So, uh, a bit of a jack of all trades, but uh, you know that's 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 a, that's a, something I really enjoy in surgery. You get your hands dirty, and you can also sit there and and think and scratch your head and be very academic about things on the ward, so it's a great mix. What are some common conditions you see? Common conditions we see, uh, again, it's going to be subspecialty service specific depending on which one I'm on. Um, we see a lot of uh, GI malignancies, a very common thing would be uh, bowel tumors. Um, most of the clientele we see are, are non-acute cases where, where, where elective surgery, uh, usually cancer-based surgeries. We do a lot of uh, gastric cancer, uh, subsequently work up patients, proceeding towards uh, um, coming up with a plan in conjunction with the medical oncology and radiation oncology teams, uh, planning chemotherapy, radiation, whatever is appropriate for that case, and then eventually moving on to a surgical plan. Um, like I said, all GI malignancies. Um, the, 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 the sexier part of the job, I always say, is, is you know, it, doesn't get a, it doesn't get as much attention as cardiology, but is the, the, the liver surgeries. Um, some of the procedures we do are, are absolutely fascinating and very large and, and require a, a level of expertise that is, 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 is mind-blowing. We do Whipple procedures for uh, pancreatic cancer, pancreatic head lesions. Um, we just started doing a procedure called HIPEC or uh, heated intraperitoneal extracorporeal uh, chemotherapy. So it's a large uh, surgery where we infuse chemo into patients' abdomens, again for GI malignancies, do fairly extensive cytoreductions, reductions, fairly extensive resections, uh, and then you know, take that patient from the operating room and, and, and hopefully get them home after a, a moderately long stay. Uh, but yeah, the, the bulk of my, my practice is based on GI malignancies uh, as elective cases. Well, in the OR, are you first assist or are there some things that uh, hmm. you might do if a second surgeon would as well? Yeah, great question. And I find people who are interested in surgery, they'll ask a lot, um, you know, like that question, am I going to be first assist? Like, what do you do in the OR? Because, you know, people want to come into the OR, they, you know, newly graduated PAs, they want to use their skill set and they want to build their skill set. And it's, it's not a lot of fun to just be standing there and holding a retractor, which a lot of us end up doing in our, in our early clinical rotations. But no, most definitely, uh, when I come into a case, uh, I'm, 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 I'm first assist. Uh, as first assist, uh, you're working, you know, 
directly across from your attending. Um, you are more involved and our surgeons are great and as, as their confidence is built uh, in, in my abilities, you know, they ask you for legitimate uh, opinions during the procedure. Like, what is this? What do you think we should do? And it's a great learning opportunity. Um, bottom line is, if it's not really busy on the ward, even if we have a full OR with, uh, with multiple different learners, it's still a good opportunity and not to like kind of say holding a retractor, there's, there's, there's no benefit in there. I'll go in there a lot when uh, I don't have much going on in the ward and I will stand there and I'll hold a retractor or I'll just spectate because it's a great learning opportunity. You don't get an anatomy lesson uh, anywhere like you do in the operating room with an open abdomen and it's, it's, there's, you have to seek out your own learning opportunities. But yeah, work, working as a, as a as first assistant in the operating room is definitely one of the uh, more exciting parts of the job. It's, uh, do you open, close, stitch or things like that? Uh, it's going to really depend on the complexity of the case. Um, and this is going to vary by practice as well too. I, we have a huge amount of physician assistants working in plastics and their surgical their, 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 their surgical skills are, are just absolutely exceptional and mind-blowing. Um, as far as my own contributions in the operating room, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, opening, closing, uh, a lot of the cases, especially the, the less complicated ones, and it depends on the surgeon. You know, you, you develop a reputation, you develop your skills, they get more confident in you. Um, you know, we have a lot of utility there in allowing the physician at the end of the case to leave the room. Um, move on, see the next patient, maybe go help in another operating room suite. Uh, and as a physician assistant, even having a med student there, I have an opportunity to show med students and you know, contribute to their learning, showing them how to close an abdomen uh, and freeing up the physician's uh, time essentially, which is a, a, key, a key role of a, of a PA is to increase that system efficiency. So yes, opening, closing, uh, putting in drains, um, taking the patient out of the operating room. And outside of the OR, what are some procedures that you do? Yeah, uh, typical procedures, again, service specific depending on where I'm at at that time, we'll do uh, like wide local excisions of, of certain types of lesions in our procedure room in the cancer care uh, area. Um, a lot of the time it's, it's, there's a physician nearby uh, or I'm, I'm, I'm doing a small case with a, with a learner, with a junior learner, and we're kind of going over it. Um, but yeah, so wide local excisions of various different dermatological lesions uh, on the wards, uh, doing things such as uh, paracentesis, um, assisting with very minor things as well too, like NG insertion, uh, IV insertion, uh, central line insertion. Um, we're a little spoiled at health sciences and we have a lot of uh, specialty teams that come in do a lot of these tasks. Um, other procedures. Uh, that I'll do on the ward, uh, the opening of wounds which are infected, irrigating, debriding, um, a whole host of things. Every, it's, it's truly um, everything perioperative that you, can, that you can think of. Why did you come into this position having those skill sets and being able to do them independently or how, how was that incorporated into your job? Yeah, um, so a lot of the, uh, a lot of the other skills, um, you know, like NG tube insertion, uh, IV insertion, um, those are things that I traditionally did as a nurse, so I was very comfortable doing that. But uh, I remember the first time I opened up a wound and I just thought it was the coolest thing. And you know, all it is now is popping a few staples and sticking some forceps in there. But you know, how I, how I learned that, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's an outdated mentality that stems from old school medicine. It's the see one, do one, teach one. And uh, I, I don't think it's sufficient in this day and age um, to go by that model. But it, you know, admittedly, a lot of my skills I picked up were the see one, do one, teach one. Uh, fortunately, I worked with a lot of residents, a lot of senior residents. So even though I wasn't necessarily directly learning from my attending, uh, at times, you know, I would I had great opportunities to kind of go in there with a with a senior resident, and we talked about procedural skills. And yeah, I think I, I, I saw one, and then later on that afternoon I did one, and now I teach them. But uh, yeah, we always have to be careful when learning new skills because we have to be not only confident um, that we're gonna do it right, but we have to be confident to, to know what to do if something goes wrong. Uh, and that's just part of our own personal, uh, our professional responsibility. When you're starting off learning anything, it's it's we want to learn how to do do it. You know what are the what are the steps? You know you're doing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And, you know you're, you're you're trying to point out anatomy on the on the screen to a learner, and you're saying, well, these are the steps. These are the steps. Um, 
very soon you have to start realizing well, what what is what happens if this happens here and it's very hard to train for that and that's where just exposure comes into comes into play is very important you have to get your numbers in you have to you know when you when, when you see an opportunity to do a procedure go and do it you're not hoping that something goes wrong but the only way you're going to see that and learn how to deal with it is uh, is actually getting your numbers in um, there's always always has to be a connect between uh, ongoing per, uh, like professional development, CME, and reading. Um, and we have a responsibility to know anytime we do a procedure how to handle the complications associated with that. And there's an expectation. The learning doesn't end when you're out of school. You have to go home, you have to pick up a book, you have to say, okay, now I know these steps of doing set procedure. And you gotta look at every one of those steps and say, what do I do if something goes wrong between each of those transition points? And that's the bridging of the academic aspect back to the clinical aspect, and it never ends. And you always have to refine how you handle these things. And you know, with a supportive team like I have, it's very easy to you know, bring up these topics. You know, anytime I'm sent off to do something new that I've never done before, one of the first things I'm thinking in my head, okay, well, what if something goes wrong? And you have to be, comfortable to ask these things because if you don't know, you don't know. And um, what can patients expect from you or how do you interact with patients as a PA? Yeah, so I, I not many people love the scut work on the ward. I, I love it. I, it it's, it's, I get to be there all the time. If a patient has an issue, I can walk into the room. I try to be seen by patients as much as possible. I try to interact with staff and, and kind of come up with plans with, with the nursing staff on the ward too. So how I, how I interact with patients, you know, I, I do my own rounds every afternoon in the morning, and then we all round as a team, and then in the afternoon I come around and like do that spot check, you know, like what's going on. And the main part is not so much to see if something's, if something's missed, um, because we got a great nursing staff there and, and other support services that, you know, I, I'm, I'm confident are able to inform me. I, I, I love doing my rounds to talk to patients to kind of let them know that they're being cared for and their eyes on them. There are people who, who are who, who legitimately care about their, their well-being and their recovery um, going around. And a lot of the time it's, you know, I, I allocate, you know, about an hour depending on how many patients we have on the ward to spend. Um, and I, I end up rounding like for multiple hours, sometimes we get the conversation. We, you know, just just talking to patients is one of the. the it sound it sounds, it sounds cliche. It sounds a little uh, fluffy, but it, it's 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 really rewarding to just talk to people, um, and kind of get a better grasp of what they're experiencing, and then kind of pull that into your own practice and kind of adjust your approach uh, to you know clinic-based medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you interact with nursing and allied health? Yeah, so. Allied Health is omnipresent at, at the Health Sciences Center, and you know you you become very reliant on them, and you develop great relationships. And it behooves you to to, to develop a good relationship with them. Um, I I lean on our, our pharmacists like a crutch. I, I I love having their expertise, their input. Um, so I'm spoiled in that respect. You know, it's it's versus a PA who may be working in a mine or be be in a rural scenario where they really have to, you know really use their resources very wisely due to limitations and, and kind of think outside the box and, and move in. I have the luxury of being able to pull in all these specialty services. So, you know, it's developing relationships is really big. Nursing has always been very easy. Um, I know when I came on, it, it, you feel like, you know, you're the new person on the block and, and everybody's scrutinizing you. My easy way in was, you know, talking about my past as well. Um, I very great relationships with them. I, I, I advocate for transparency and not being afraid to contact the team with any questions. We're all learning together. Uh, most of the nurses have my number. If there's something going on versus paging me, they'll shoot me a text. And it's, it's a more efficient way of doing things. And yeah, it's, 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 you, have to, you have to have that relationship with the multidisciplinary team. It's, it's, you, know, you don't have to like everyone you work with, but um, you know, it's not about us, it's about the patients. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, how do you interact with physicians? What is the PAMD relationship like? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's highly variable. I, I, I keep things pretty professional. Um, I don't have any issues ever approaching my attendings. Uh, they're very easy to reach, whether it's, 
you know, me having a question on the ward, you know, throwing on a scrub cap, going into the operating room, looking over the drape. You know, they know when I show up there's usually something bad going on and <laughs> I'm either giving them bad news or asking for some advice. Um, but they're great, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll see me in the operating room, we can have a quick conversation about what's going on, any questions will be addressed. Uh, plans determine if I'm uncomfortable. Um, they're also available by, you know, by phone. It's, it's very easy to get a hold of, uh, of, of, of my physicians. Um, I say I do keep our relationship fairly, uh, fairly professional. Uh, I work with multiple physicians. I, I think I, I have contracts signed with about 12 of them. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and do you find that um, is the relationship, uh, well, is your role more autonomous or is the MD seeing every patient that you see or round on every patient that you see? Right, right. So uh, the level of autonomy actually amazed me when I, when I started as a PA. Um, I believe, again, I, I, I espouse transparency and I think one of the biggest ways to get yourself into, into trouble and, and even, you know, possibly hurt patients is to not ask when you have questions. Uh, I autonomously uh, you know, initiate diagnostics, uh, conduct procedures without, um, without necessarily consulting in advance with my attending. And that, that evolves over time when you, again, are comfortable with your skill set, you know what the expectation is. Um, at the same time, I always make it a point to, to deliver that information at the end of the day. It's, we have a great structure and you know, they round in the morning, I round in the afternoon, and then the attendings usually come around after the operating rooms are, 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 are all, after the operations are all done, we round in the evening. And I like to always disclose things that, I, that, I, that have come up with their patients. If I were to be called down to a clinic to see a patient, um, even if it's something minute, I always mention, you know, so-and-so was in here. And just, it just closes a loop, it uh, facilitates discussion. Sometimes there are learning opportunities that, that arise out of that. Um, and I, I, I tell everyone, I'm like, being autonomous, working autonomously is, is it's, it's great, but always ask questions, try to stimulate conversation with the attendings. Um, if you don't know something, it's just learning opportunities. But yeah, I have a high degree of uh, autonomy in the clinical setting. You mentioned uh, initiating procedures mm -hmm. and diagnostic um, mm -hmm. uh, interventions. Yeah. And is that within the scope of practice of a PA? Within. Um, we have to be careful that uh, when we do initiate uh, interventions or conduct procedures that they are within the scope of practice of our attending physician. Um, I don't ever make the decision autonomously to start a patient on chemotherapy or anything like that because that's not within, first off, my knowledge base nor is it within the, uh, the scope of practice of my attending physician. So. Uh, any procedure I do, I, I try to make sure that it is something that I'm well versed in, uh, am authorized to do that, and that usually develops uh, as your relationship with the attendings develop over time. You kind of figure out what they want to delegate to you as work and what they feel comfortable with you doing, but it must remain within their scope of practice. And so, whatever your attending physician is able to do and they're comfortable with delegating, you're able to do yourself as well. Yes. Generally speaking, absolutely. I, I sometimes joke around and I say, if my attending uh, tells me to remove somebody's brain, I can remove somebody's brain. <laughs> but, like, joking, obviously, but I mean, it's it's they're negotiated, um, they're negotiated tasks. Um, like I said, it just builds over time. And but uh, yeah, I, I, I've a quite a great mixed bag of, of skills and procedures that uh, I'm allowed to do. And what do you enjoy about being a PA? Well, being a PA, uh, best job I've ever had. <laughs> um, when I was at that crossroads of, of you know what I what I wanted to do next for for an education program when I was in nursing, you know, I do an MP stream. Do I pursue something like 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 medicine, like formally, or go into the PA thing? You know, I I, I wanted something that I wasn't forfeiting uh, previous previous skills that I had developed. I wanted the patient uh, interaction aspect. And I wanted, I wanted portability of my job as well, which is, which is important. I wanted the ability to move around within specialties and, and just gain a better understanding of, of, of the system. So what I love about being a PA is, is the variety. Um, my ability to dedicate five, 10 years of my life in a surgical subspecialty and then maybe even moving on to something else and you know just 
learning something different in medicine perhaps or you know going into dermatology uh, you don't get that as a, as a physician you're kind of locked in unless you're going to go and do another residency so it's, it's the ability to move around and, and get a variety uh, get a variety of, of exposure it's, it's enriching even it's enriching for any variety is great I'm an Ontario PA, obviously, um, and you work in Manitoba, and yes. in Manitoba PAs are regulated. So what is regulation, and how does it impact PA practice? Yeah, <clears throat> so there's, uh, there's a lot of terms like thrown around in this, in, this, uh, in this conversation. There's registration, there's regulation, there's law. Um, so regulation in Manitoba, what, PAs are regulated through uh, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Manitoba. Um, what regulation um, is meant to do, it's the primary primary purpose of regulation is to protect the public. Um, regulation uh, focuses around tasks uh, and job scope appropriate things for different uh, members in whatever field you're talking about, whether it's, it's, it's regulation for, for lawyers or regulations for, for medical personnel. Um, it's, it's important um, to me, it's, it's a level of accountability, it's, it's part of accountability and, 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 and transparency as well, uh, which is very important when you're dealing with, um, with the public and you know, the, the potential to do harm in, in healthcare is, is, is abs it's, it's high, it's a legitimate concern and regulation is um, it, it's, a, it's a measure to protect the public from having harm done to them. Uh, in, in, in medical practice, uh, it's hard to tease. There, there are nuances, nuances to it. But uh, what impact uh, do patients, staff, the department notice or benefit from from having PAs mm. working with them? The feedback, and I'm always cautious with with the feedback because it's 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 anecdotal. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we have is, as as PAs is is the tracking. The contributions we make to the system, you know, we, we, we should be increasing efficiency and it's hard to kind of track that with physicians, uh, at least in Canada, we don't have our own billing numbers, so it's kind of hard to like kind of figure out exactly what we're doing. But anecdotally speaking, you know, I, I get great feedback. I, I wish I wish some, some people were tracking these numbers though, but um, nursing staff will say, you know, you know, time, time, time to discharge has been shortened because they're not waiting for uh, residents or physicians to come out of the OR at the end of the day when all other services are shut down. Um, uh, complaints, I was told um, by, by one of our um, patient advocates, they, 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 I think they've been, been tracking, they're saying that uh, complaints coming from the wards where PAs are working are actually down, although I've never seen that data myself. Um, uh, the, the, the biggest thing is, is just having, the, the biggest, biggest piece of feedback I get uh, from the multidisciplinary team is that it's, it's just such an asset to have a clinician that's available um, pretty much all the time uh, with the ward, uh, ward aspects and, and the management of patients perioperatively and kind of facilitating that transition home or transfers or getting little procedures done and paperwork done. Um, but yeah, I would really like to see uh, this studied uh, and scrutinized a little bit more and, and getting some data on it so that we can truly show our worth, especially uh, in a time when, when there are a lot of healthcare cuts and, and reshaping of the healthcare system, especially in Manitoba. There's this myth that, you know, once you become a PA, that's sort of it. That's where the growth stops. So yeah. you've uh, pursued higher education, leadership in healthcare, and an MBA. Yeah. So what inspired you to pursue that? Uh, I get antsy sitting still. I don't. Uh, I don't like to not be in school, um, and uh, you know, I, I, I want to. I, I've been a clinician for so long in, in a few different health sciences related fields, and you know, I was asking myself, like, you know, what do I, what do I, what can I do that's gonna, that's gonna kind of enrich my my own knowledge base, um, and what do I want in the future? Um, I have to be realistic. I mean, you know. One day I may not be wanting to or maybe be able to be somebody running around and operating for hours and hours. And the natural progression for me, you know, whether you're a plumber, a doctor, a PA, a nurse, whatever, it, it's, it's the next step I've always envisioned is, is making a contribution at, uh, from the top down essentially, uh, you know, and, and, and changing systems, uh, system transformation. And that comes and, and, and requires uh, 
uh, knowledge of, of administration. And, you know, I, 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 I love clinical work. I can't imagine leaving clinical work right now. It's, it's, it's where my heart is. But uh, one of the big reasons for me pursuing a, an MBA is just to gain a different perspective, to actually see what is happening uh, with the numbers uh, from a financial perspective of the healthcare system? How sustainable is this system? And you know, you know, we're we're in a we're in a profession where we were I, I view it as you know PAs were brought in because of system inefficiencies, and I just wanted to better understand this um, that aspect of, of of healthcare and kind of consolidate my knowledge and and you know one day transition into that and maybe be the person who writes the goofy uh, policies that everybody complains about. Um, but yeah, I look at it as almost like a capstone on my career, um, eventually just understanding that and being able to make a, a, a change hopefully in the future from a policy level. Any projects that you're working towards, whether it's research or advocacy related? Right? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not done my MBA yet. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be complete in sometime next year in 2020, I believe August. I've taken my time, uh, worked full time as well. Um, my research interests are focused around sustainability uh, as well as leadership and organization, which are my two concentrations in the MBA curriculum. Um, as far as uh, you know, what I hope to pursue after that and, and interests, I mean, uh, I would love to start looking at research focusing on um, you know, quantitative metrics for different healthcare practitioners and different professions and how they contribute, which I alluded to before. I think that's really lacking in, in the PA profession in Canada anyways. We extrapolate a lot of our data from the U.S. Um, and then also looking at, uh, at, at sustainability. It's a, it's, a, it's a buzzword right now, um, but trying to essentially look at ways that we can make, uh, make our healthcare system here in Canada a little bit more robust, seeing where we can contribute, where we can maybe move our health human resources around to, to achieve these goals. Um, advocacy you also mentioned too. Advocacy is, I look at advocacy as, um, as something that every PA or anybody in any profession has to do, you know, even though we're not part of necessarily uh, uh, manifest uh, advocacy boards, we advocate on a daily basis through our work too, and, and we all have to remember that. So I, I always get on my high horse and say, like, well, I'm advocating every day, and I, I try to advocate by, by demonstrating a level of competence um, in the way I do my work on the war, the way I interact with people. Um, but yeah, I, I would like to tie in like my research. Um, I mean, I'm biased, I'm a PA. I like to tie in my research on sustainability into, um, into advocacy for PAs, and, and I'd, I'd love to show some numbers one day. Uh, saying like, look, this is objective, this is what we're providing to the system.